that the Lord led on my um, heart is the story of this uh, woman in the scripture, a beloved woman, loved very, very much, a woman that the husband served many years to gain, a woman that the husband gave much of what he had to. And when came time, the husband said, let's, let's, let's leave your place of origin and let's go back home, my home. And she voluntarily uh, departed her land of origin. But unfortunately, she didn't quite make it to the homeland proper. And I believe we have some things to learn from her story because the stories of the people in the Bible are our story. And so when you look at her life, there are some hidden details tucked in somewhere that the Lord wants us to look at and learn from. How one can be loved, how one can be loved even by God, but if care is not taken, one can still forfeit the ultimate goal of God for, one, for one's life. I pray that will not be our own experience in the mighty name of Jesus. It's the story of Rachel. Story of Rachel. How many of us know who Rachel is in the Bible? All right. So Rachel is the wife of Jacob. And so the Bible tells us just a little background about Jacob, the second son of who? Isaac. He had this little scheme that he, he put together and deceived his brother. So he ran. He had to run for his life. And because of the fear, he ran far away from home, ended up in Syria, Padan Aram, with his mother's uncle, Laban. When you read the story, immediately he got there, as he set his eyes on this lady, Rachel, something connected. And from there, I think is what you call love at first sight. Jacob couldn't just help himself. He loved this beautiful girl. And the Bible says Rachel was beautiful in form and in appearance. And so Jacob would do anything to make sure that he gets this lady. When the woman brings Jacob to her father's house and says, this is the man I, I met today. The Bible says after a month of uh, being with Laban, Laban asked Jacob, what would I give you? It's been, I read somewhere that their custom in those days is they can house a guest for a month free. You don't pay anything. They just, they, they will be very hospitable to you. But then after that, obviously you cannot just keep living in somebody's house for free. Even though this is his uh, nephew. Laban was Jacob's uncle. So after about a month, he now asks, okay, it looks like you're going to sojourn with me for a while. What's the deal? What will I give you for working for me? And Jacob said, oh, I will serve you for seven years for one of your daughters. Which one? Rachel, of course. The man said, okay, that's okay. No, no problem. You want to marry Rachel? Hey, you are, we are, it's, it's, everything is staying in the, in the family. You see, at that time, they were, they were permitted to marry extended family. Even before that, they were even marrying siblings, you know, direct siblings. So the deal was struck. Jacob was going to serve for seven years. And the Bible says something, that he served Laban for seven years, and it was as if it was a few days. Why? Because he so much loved, you know, Rachel, the seven years just flew by. After seven years, if you know the story, the night of the wedding, there was a switch. 
Laban tricked the trickster. And in the morning, he realized that, uh oh, I got somebody else. He was angry. Why did you treat me like this? Laban, you see, it, it, it appears that the, this trickery and deception kind of ran in the family. You know, when you read the story, you see all kinds of intrigues in this family. I think deception is part of the, the, the lineage there and also the culture. There are still some areas of the world today, even in this uh, Mid-Eastern area, which is the same place we were talking about, the, you know, Syria and, and those kind of areas. You know, it, it, look at business. You see some of the, the Easterners that they are very shrewd in business. They are very, they, they know their way around. So the man said, no, you don't have to be angry. I, I gave you the elder sister, Leah, because in our culture, we don't just give out, we cannot marry out the younger sister before the elder sister. Jacob was still angry. He now said, well, I will give you Rachel only if you will serve me another seven years. Now, just, just think about that, if that was you. I mean, you've labored, hard labor for seven years for something. And then at the end, when you're supposed to get what you have been waiting for, it was switched on you. And the man said, well, can you do another seven years? What did Jacob respond? I will. <laughs> I will. Because I must get Rachel. And so he did. So he did. That tells us something. This was a beloved lady. This man was going to get him at all costs. After serving for another seven years, making 14, Jacob wanted to leave the land. Because as I told you, when you I'm just giving you some background as we launch into the story. All the while Jacob was serving uh, Laban, he was deceptive, deceptive. He kept changing his wages. He kept dealing with him very you know, shrewdly. When he was 14 years... Jacob said, okay, I have my wife plus one extra that I didn't really uh, bargain for, but anyway, let me leave. The man said, you cannot leave. He said, I'm leaving. He said, well, if you serve me just a little bit more before you leave, at least I want to see my grandchildren. I want to see all of them around. Tricks, tricks. Jacob agreed to serve him a little bit more, but he now cut a deal. I don't want anything from you. I would it will be on my terms. I will choose which of your animals will be mine. And Jacob chose the ones that are, that are least desirable. You see, in those days, uh, you know, the sheep and the goat, the ones that have most values are the ones that have one color. If it's black, it's all black. If it's white, all white. But the one with speckles and mixed colors didn't sell that much. They were in high value, you know, animals. So Jacob said, whatever of your foe that has the speckles and everything, let them be mine. And I will not touch anything that belongs to you. Guess what? Laban was happy. He said, oh, it looks like you, you, you don't know how to cut a deal. Jacob trusted himself to God's care. And in no, in, in, in no uh, long time, the man began to prosper. Because God made sure that the animals that were being bred, majority of them were coming out in the favor of Jacob. So Jacob was prospering. The Bible now says, some other argument grew. The children of Laban said, this man has taken all the fortune of our father because now he's so prosperous. Jacob heard that and he said, that's it, I'm leaving. And God himself now spoke to Jacob, leave and go. And Jacob decided to leave and he spoke to his wives. Now Leah and Rachel, they already have with everything in between that I left out because of our time, Jacob had grew, grown very prosperous with big family. As of right now, he already had 11 children. And he wanted to leave. And so, now turn with me to Genesis. And let's read the departure. So this will take us where we are going. Genesis chapter 31. And so, Jacob, speaking to his wives now about his decision to leave, he tells them that the angel of the Lord spoke to him. And the angel of the Lord did speak to him. In fact, 
look at verse, um, I'd like you to look at verse 1. Look at verse 1, Genesis 31. Now Jacob had the words of Laban's son, saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's, and from what was our father's, he has acquired all his wealth. And Jacob uh, saw the countenance of Laban. Indeed, it was not favorable toward him as before. Then the Lord said to Jacob, now watch that. The Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers, that is Canaan, and to your family, and I will be with you. Verse 11. So Jacob is now retreating this to the wives. Then the angel of the Lord spoke to me in a dream, saying, Jacob, I said, here I am. And he said, lift up your eyes now and see. All the rams which leap on the flocks are streaked, speckled, and gray-spotted. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anoint, anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land and return to the land of your family. Where was Jacob going? Bethel. God said, go to Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. Bethel was where Jacob met the Lord when he was running in the first place from his brother. And he made a covenant with God. If you go with me, protect me in my journey because I'm going to a place I, I've never been. I will make an altar to you on this same spot and I worship you. 20 years passed. God said, get up, go back to Bethel. You will worship me there, but ultimately go back to your father's land. So you get the instruction. It's clear. Now listen to what Rachel and Leah, the two wives, said. Look at their response. Then Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, Is there still any portion in, of the entrance for us in our father's house? Expecting the answer to be no. Are we not considered strangers by him for he has sold us and also completely consumed our money for all these riches which God has taken from our father are really ours and our children. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do it. So God said, go back. I will be with you. The wives agree. Everybody agree. But that's when the story gets interesting. Verse 17. Then Jacob rose and set his sons and his wife on camels, and he carried away all his livestock and all his possession which he had gained in uh, gain, his acquired livestock which he had gained in Padan Aram to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. Watch that. Pay attention. Now Laban had gone to share his sheep, and Rachel had stolen the household idols that were her father's. When you look at that, it's like, how did that come in? They agreed to go. Jacob was wealthy, very wealthy. In fact, now the issue is that his wealth has grown so much that the sons of his uncle are jealous. All right? So they had no lack of anything. They are going back to Canaan, the land of Abraham, uh, Jacob's father. And all of a sudden, we just see in this verse, verse 19, Laban at this time, on this particular day, was not home. He went to share his sheep. And guess what Rachel did? Rachel went into the house. And he stole the household idols. They must be little things. They, they are, in the Hebrew, they are called terrapins. They are little figurines. I don't know if you, you have seen them. I mean, I'm sure you've seen them. You might not know. They are just little doll that they will be carved in the image of human beings. They came in different sizes. Some of them are life size. Some of them are small. She stole all these little uh, figurines and stuffed them in a baggage. And the Bible says... And Jacob stole away, unknown to Laban the Syrian, in that he did not tell him and he in, that he intended to flee. So Jacob and everybody just left in a hurry. So he fled with all that he had. He arose and crossed the river and headed toward the mountain of Gilead. Now, the Bible says to us, verse 22, Laban was told on the third day that Jacob had left. He gathered everybody. He was angry. And he ran after them. When he got there, he, he wanted to chew Jacob up. Why did you take my daughters and my grandchildren and everything that belonged to me? But because God had spoken to him and said, leave that man alone. Don't do anything to him. Just leave him alone. Don't speak evil or good. He could not do what he wanted to do. But now he had something to say. He had something to stand on. What was it? His idols that have been taken. <laughs> Look at this. So, and 
in verse 26. And Laban said to Jacob when he caught up with him after three days, What have you done that you have stolen away unknown to me and carried away my daughters like captives taken with sword? Why did you flee away secretly and steal away from me and not tell me? And he lies. For I might have sent you away with joy and songs. That's a lie. With timbre and harp. That's a lie. You did not allow me to kiss my sons and my daughter. Now you have done foolishly in doing this. It is in my power to harm you, but the God of your father spoke to me last night saying, be careful that you speak to Jacob, neither good nor bad. Now, here is where we are going. Verse 30. And now you have surely gone because you greatly long for your father's house, but why did you steal my gods? Then Jacob was angry. All right, now, after all you've done for me all these years, do I not have the right to take my wife and my children? You just want to keep us as slaves? But that was not the, what angered Jacob the most. What angered him now is that this father-in-law now said, why did you steal my God? When you look at verse 19, what Rachel stole, the Bible says right there, the household idols. It's translated as ISO idols. The, the, the word is therapying their little images. But when Laban was going to talk about them, he called them his gods. So they are things that were worshipped. They were things that represented God and multiple gods anyway to them. Why did you steal my God? Look at Jacob. Then Jacob answered and said to Laban, because I was afraid for I had said, perhaps you will take your daughters from me by force. That's why I left without telling you. With whomever you find your gods, let him not leave. Jacob swears. How would I take your gods? I'm, I'm, I'm already blessed. What am I going to do with your gods? I have my God, Yahweh. Why would I take your God? And of course, Jacob also swear on behalf of everybody. Nobody here will have taken your God. What are we going to do with your God? I serve the God of my father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he swore, whoever you've, you're going to search here, anyone that you find your little things that you call God, let the person not leave. You see, words are very powerful. Why did Jacob do this? He didn't know anybody had taken it. Look at it. Verse that verse 20, uh, 30, uh, 32. For Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. Hmm. Why would a beautiful woman like this, that had been in the presence of her husband, loved, what was she going to do with little things? Little Barbie dolls, little gods. That's what we want to explore today. Now, Laban took Jacob's, Jacob up on his word. He went into Jacob's tent. He didn't find it, verse 33. He went to Leah's tent, the older wife. He didn't find it. He went into the maid's tent. He didn't find them. Then he went out of Leah's tent and entered into Rachel's tent. This man was desperate to find these gods. Now, Rachel had taken the household idols, put them in the camel's saddle, and sat on them. This, this was a very smart woman. <laughs> and Laban searched all about the tent, but did not find them. And she said to her father, let it not displease you, my Lord, that I cannot rise before you. Rachel said, my dad, you know, I'm supposed to get up and greet you and everything, but you know, I cannot get up. Why? She said, uh, for the manner of women is with me. That is taken to me a menstrual, uh, menstruation period. I mean, I'm doing my period. I cannot get up. And he sat, but did not find the household idols. Was she in doing anything? No, she just lied. Because what she sat on, that's where the idols were. And Laban did not find it and left. And they went on with the idols. Okay, end of that story for now. I said to us that Jacob, Rachel was a beloved wife. This woman's story represents the story of Many of us as children of God. Just as Jacob loved Rachel and said, it's time for us to go. If you look, the Bible tells us that the church is the bride of Jesus from whom he labored. Isn't it? Jacob served many years, 14 years for Rachel. Because the first seven was lost and then he served another one. The Bible says every believer is a bride of Christ. Look, just look at last week and, uh, and the Good Friday and you remember the suffering of Jesus for every believer to make us his children. 
So Rachel stands for you and I, loved by Jesus, who gave his life ultimately to take us to him. Jacob removed the entire household from Padan Aram to take them to his father's land, Canaan. The church is called the called out one. Jesus said, I am going to prepare a place for you, right? So that I can come and take you with me. That you will be with me where I am in my father's kingdom. Rachel believed in the God of Jacob and she voluntarily agreed to go with her husband to Canaan. Now, it is true that Rachel really believed in the God of Jacob. I will, I will give you two evidences. Because we are trying to find out why did she do this. Is it because she didn't believe in God of Jacob? He, she believed in the God of Jacob. Number one, I know that Rachel be, believed in the God of Jacob because she named her first son Joseph. And the meaning of Joseph means he had. But the he there is Yahweh had. Yahweh is the proper name of God. Now, before the coming of Jacob into this house, they serve all kinds of idols. So they didn't know the name Yahweh. So Jacob had introduced to them that I am the grandson of Abraham. Obviously, they know Abraham. That is the family of Abraham that he left. And the name of the God of Abraham and Isaac now is Yahweh. When Rachel was going to name her first son that she waited for for about 10 years, Joseph, he called him Yahweh Ads. Why would she do that? Because she has now come to believe in Yahweh. Let me show it to you in the scripture. Genesis chapter 30 verse 24. Genesis 30, 24. So she called his name Joseph and said, the Lord. Right there, when your Bible, you see it's capital L-O-R-D. Whenever you see that, it's not the word for master, which is used for Lord, is the word Yahweh. The Lord shall add to me another son. What is the point? This woman that took idols actually believed that the Lord was the one that gave her the son. Number two, how do we know that she believed God? Look at her response when Jacob said, let's go. Go back to verse 31, verse 14, chapter 31, verse 14. After Jacob had said, God showed me and I'm ready to go, the Bible says, then Rachel and Leah answered and said to him. The first thing you should notice here is, the first name, Rachel. Otherwise, it should have been Leah and Rachel. Because Leah is the older sister. Leah is the first wife. But we know that Rachel is the one that is beloved. And in this, in this verse, the Bible says, Rachel first. So in this place, it's as if like Rachel was even speaking for the wives. And look at her response. It shows that she believed God. Le Rachel and Leah answered and said to to him, is there still any portion in the inheritance for us in our father's house? And verse 16, for all these riches which God has taken from our father are really ours and our children. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do it. So, she's a believer in God. Just one problem. She still took household idols with her. That is the big question. If she believed in God, why? What is the reason that she agreed to leave the land of her origin? No force, no, for, uh, no, no coercion. She believed in the God of the land she's going to. She believed it was that God that gave her Joseph. And she even believed that that God who had another son to, to her. Why all out of all of that, take little dolls, idols, household idols. Well, let's look at those idols. Number one, the Bible calls them household. Okay? I've said they are little figuring images. What were they used for? In the ancient time, and still even in some areas of, this, of the world today, they are used for divination and oracular purposes. You know, they will consult them. They believe that there are spirits of God in these things that will speak to people to give them direction or to divine for them. There's an example because it was not this people alone that practiced it. Even the Babylonians practiced it. Uh, look at Ezekiel chapter 21, 21. We're trying to figure out what is it about these idols. Ezekiel 21, 21. This is talking about the king of Babylon. Are you there? Ezekiel 21, 21. For the king of Babylon stood at the parting of the way when he was coming to overtake Judah. At the head of the two ways, 
to use divination. He made his arrows bright. He consulted with images. The word images there is the same word that is translated as household idol, therapy. He consulted, he looked into the liver. Here is the image. This man was going for warfare. When he got to like a T-junction, he put his idols down and began to consult with this thing to give him direction where he should go, what city he should fight first. So these therapies were believed to give information. They, they gave oracles. They gave direction. And so Rachel decided to take them with her. Even though she believed in Yahweh. You know what the problem of Rachel is? One of, the first one is she practiced what is called syncretism. Syncretism is when you try to put together, you try to amalgamate together different religions, different culture and everything. You put them together like a hodgepodge in, in, you know, and you put everything together and you keep using all of it to syncretize religion. So although Rachel had believed in Yahweh, although Rachel had named her son after Yahweh, even though Rachel had witnessed that Yahweh can bless, because Yahweh had blessed her husband, when it came time to leave the land, she added the gods of her family to Yahweh, the God of her husband. That's what you are seeing here. Why? She was a Syrian. And the Syrians had idols. Every household perhaps had their own idols that would give them, give them oracles. That is the problem. In her mind, the God of her husband was perhaps just one of the gods. You see, the people that practice syncretism, they are not far from just a regular idol worshiper because usually idol worshippers have multiple gods. Now, a syncretist will now, whatever newest or latest god that that one believes in, will, be, will just add it to the other god. So they have different one of them. Look at what Laban said. Why did you take away my gods? Plural. So, perhaps in the mind of Rachel, this other God, Yahweh, the God of Jacob, is just one other God to be added to the gods of the land. So, she believed in that God, but in her mind, she didn't see anything wrong in consulting multiple gods. Are you following me? That's why she decided to take along the household gods. They will work together with Yahweh and everything will be complete. To her mind, the God of Jacob could peacefully coexist with the gods of the land. But it was an error. It's one as, it was an error. I want us to try to get into this woman's mind just a little bit. Why would she need multiple gods? Number one, I think there are two reasons. Rachel appeared to be someone with strong ties to the beliefs and superstition of our culture and household. I think when we look at her, she's a person that has strong ties to all the superstitions and the beliefs of our culture. That even Jacob had been with her 20 years. The beliefs and the superstitions of her household and of Syria never left her. There was one incident before this that reveals to us that Rachel was this kind of a person. You know why? Why didn't Leah take the idols with her? After all, they were born in the same household. After all, she was older. Why didn't Leah take the idols with her? So I don't think it's just that because they were Syrians, because the other woman didn't do it, but there is something about Rachel that appeared to be she was somebody steeped in the in the practices of her family, of her land, and she was into superstition. And when, after 20 years of knowing Yahweh God, she still couldn't let go some of those things that she was brought up in. That's why she secretly stole these idols. She hid them. She lied about them. She even hear her husband curse whoever has them, but she still was not going to give them up. Something about her that we need to learn from. She was too much into the believes of a family before she met Yahweh 
that she couldn't let them go. Let me show you one, one thing that might give us this inside. Genesis 30, verse 14 to 15. Genesis 30, verse 14 to 15. Reuben is the first son of Jacob by Leah. So by this time, he's probably like 10 years old or 5 years old. He's a young, he's a young child. The Bible says, now Reuben went in the days of the wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, this time Rachel had no child. Rachel waited for years, about 10 years or so before she had children. Leah had already had like four, four sons before anything even ever happened to Rachel. So Rachel was still barren. So then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? These are all the drama going on in the family. And Rachel said, said therefore he, Rich, uh, my husband, Jacob, will lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. Basically what Rachel did here, this is another story in Rachel's life that gives us more inside of who she was. The son comes home with mandrakes. They were just like short stem flowery plants. Like, you know, somebody had described them as yellowish. They were things that people eat. They looked more in the family of potato. So this young little boy comes home, the son of a rival wife. And Rachel said to the mother, could you please give me some of your mandrakes? Leah said, why should I? And Rachel said, okay, here's the deal. If I can have some of the mandrakes, our husband will sleep with you tonight. Now think about that. And so she exchanged the mandrakes. She did receive the mandrakes and said, honey, you can go and sleep in our room tonight. I want you to think a little bit about that. What was about mandrakes that she made a deal on this for? That is what I'm driving at. Mandrakes were believed to stimulate sexual desires and fertility in, in the uh, Mediterranean area. In fact, a writer wrote, the mandrakes in the Mediterranean plant with blue flowers in the winter and, uh, in the winter and yellow plum-like fruit in the summer. It has been desired in many cultures because of a belief that it is an aphrodisiac and promotes fertility. Aphrodisiac means it, it, it stimulates sexual desire. And so, is it possible that on this day, because of this superstitious belief in the mind of Rachel... I want those mandrakes, perhaps this might be my break to have a child. So, don't worry. I'll take the mandrakes. You can call me whatever name you want. Just have my husband for now. By the time he comes to me, I'll be pregnant. That story was just interjected there and it was left. Why? The Bible doesn't do anything without a reason. It's to show us that that's the mindset of Rachel. She believes in so many superstition of the land. After the mandrakes, there is no child, though. No child came. There are many believers that are steeped into cultural beliefs. Steeped into cultural superstitions. And they carry that thing with them into the faith. There are believers that even though they are giving their life to God, they will, they still, there are still some things that were, they were brought up in. Uh, if you do this, this will happen. If you do this, this, if you see this, this is a sign of this. And they still live with that mentality. Give me the mandrakes, maybe he will give me a child. But it didn't happen. That is one of the things about the mentality of Rachel. As a believer, what possible beliefs what possible superstitions from your culture, from your household, might you be still operating with, even though now you are exposed to the God of heaven? This is what is happening in the life of this woman. Number two, she believed in multiple gods. Just like I said, she, she thinks joining together gods will cover all the bases. Jehovah has given me Joseph. But I cannot live without the other gods because they might help when Jehovah fails. 
Maybe he give her a higher level of security for unforeseen circumstances. I want you to think about it this way. Rachel must have more assurance in taking these gods because she had been used to these gods. So how do you leave the safety of the known for the unknown? Now, they are going hundreds of miles away from Padan Aram to Canaan, where she had never been. And she said, well, just in case the God of the land of Canaan will fail, let me take with me the terapim that gives us divination, that gives us direction, so that I can take them and I make sure everything is covered. That way, I'm not going to just leave the traditional gods of my land in case the God of that land doesn't come through. Two problems with her. Superstitious and unwilling to detach from the household idol. Richest God stands for family and cultural beliefs and practices. There are many Christians that they believe in the Lord. They have made the choice to follow the Lord as their Savior. Savior. Yes, they have taken their own pre-conversion belief systems with them. It's going to be a problem with you. You are a Christian, but what culture did you come from? You have to think about that. Yes, now we are Christians, but what household did we come from? What are the beliefs of that household? What do they believe about certain things? What are the practices of that, uh, that where we came from? I believe the fact that the Bible calls it household God is very important. If it just calls it images, we will not get it. But it's called household. Brothers and sisters, now that you are a believer, that's fine. But what... What culture did you come from? What are the belief systems there that is possibly going with you? For example, in your family, what do they believe about marriage? There are Christians that they have given their life to God, but they are still running their family based on what their household, their culture believe about marriage. And it may not be according to the Bible. There are Christians that they came from the, the, the maybe religious belief that was different from Christianity. Islam, for example. There are Christians, but they still carry some values into Christianity from Islam. There are Christians that still believe certain things from Catholicism. Do you know that I, I, I have noticed that there are Christians when they pray, watch me, pay attention. I'm talking about religious beliefs and family beliefs that we bring into Christianity that God says... That cannot go with you on that journey. I've seen believers, Pentecostals, when they finish praying, they do this. What's the value of that? Cross. Does this make, any, make the devil scared or make any demon scared? No. Does it add any value to your prayer? No. There are some things they may be little that we have not paid attention to that we still do. And God says, and what does that mean? He said, I'm used to it because that's the way I brought up. Sometimes you have to detach, detach from those things because they are part of the culture and the household practices that we were used to before we knew Jesus Christ. After we know Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is an exclusive God that excludes every other thing but him. There are believers that they believe in God, but yet when things get hard, they consult some other avenues to help them with their challenges. You know, I was watching one uh, uh, drama some time ago on, on, on the TV, and the, the woman kept saying, she, she gave her life to Christ, she used to be an idol worshiper, and her daughter could not give birth to a child, just like Rachel. And years were going. If I hadn't been, the, been long, maybe like two or three years. Now she kept saying, well, ah, if not that, I've given my life to Christ. I know one woman down the street oh, that I will have gone to. She kept saying that. 
So after a while, I thought, well, why don't you just go to that woman? Because instead of you just saying, oh, it's only Jesus. It's because of Jesus. If not because of Jesus, I know what I would have done for, my, for answer. And indeed, her mind began to long for that woman. And a, a friend came and said, well, woman, has your daughter given birth yet? She said, ah, no, we are still waiting on the Lord. I said, and so, and you have not consulted the woman over there? And she said, well, how can I do that? We are Christians now. The other one told her, so, so what? Other believers still go there. It doesn't mean you cannot go to church. And this thing gripped her mind so much that even in her dream, she saw the image of Jesus, and, and as she was following Jesus, some other force was calling her. And the Lord was saying to her, woman, follow me. And she said, well, but I want to follow you, but this problem, somebody has to resolve it for me. And she turned her back in that dream, and she woke up. And when she woke up, you know, she was, she was beating, her heart was beating so hard. And the husband said, what happened? He said, well, I just had this dream. In my dream, I, I saw that man telling me to follow her. But after a long while I, I, of resisting, I turned my, my, my back on him. And the husband said, it, your problem is that you carry the problem of the barrenness of your daughter on your heart so much that you are debating whether to find other resources beside Jesus that you have given your heart to. There are believers. You must be careful. Don't take along with you what you have left behind. It may be religious. It may be family. It may be household things. There are Christians that they probably grew up in a, in a, in a family where, you know, partying and drinking and doing all those things was the order of the day. It became a household practice. Even after they have given their life to Christ, they say, well, but I don't see anything wrong in going to party at night, but I'm a child of God. I'm not going to be sleeping around, but just it is a family practice that cannot go with you to Canaan. Do you know what happened if you read this story? The Bible says they got to Bethel. Rachel made it to Bethel, the house of God. And when they departed from Bethel to go to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem, before they reached Abraham, uh, Isaac, she labored in pain. And what happened? And she died along the road. Why? She was younger than Leah, that's her second son. Leah had already gave birth to like six. So it wasn't that she was too old to bear a child. Why? That day when Jacob said, whoever you find your idol with, let him not leave. The world took long, a long time before it happened, but it happened to that woman. Why? Only because she took with her those idols. The lesson is, when you give your life to Christ, certain things cannot go with you on that journey. You must drop them because they will hinder you on the journey. This beloved woman died early. She couldn't be the mother to Samson. Now, my question is, how, how, how well did those figurines, those therapies help? Nothing. They just took her life. There are certain times that certain things in our lives we must, we must let go when we give our life to Christ. We don't need them. We don't need them because our God is exclusive God. And so don't refer to the traditions. Do you know there are Christians that still participate in festivals, certain festivals? They say this is, you know, this is what they do in our household. When they do it, I don't celebrate it, but I have to contribute my own goat or my own chicken or my own thing. When you do that... You are doing like Rachel. You are taking certain therapies with you. Even though you believe in God. God demands a change in our beliefs. In those things that we think they are valuable to life. If they contradict God. In our family, the value system of our family must change the day we give our life to Christ. You must not be superstitious. They say, when you do this, this will happen. When you do this, this will happen. That's why women say, give me the mandrakes. I think it will help me. But it didn't help. Anything that we practice after we have given our life to Christ that we don't want other believers to necessarily see because they might question it is perhaps what we should not do. When she hid it, 
Not only did she not want the father to see it because she stole it from the father, Jacob also should not see it because Jacob didn't believe in those things. Whenever you are a believer and you are, you are doing something, you say, Pastor must not see this because he will question it, but he doesn't know that is how we do in our family. That thing is wrong. Praise God. It doesn't matter how many generations it has been done. It doesn't matter whether it's what is done in the household. That's why it's called household idols. There are families, like I said before, their household, household idol is alcoholism. That's what everybody does in the family. Even when they gave their life to Christ, they say, well, I'm struggling with this because this is how I was brought up. How one is brought up is not the issue. When you give your life to Christ, it becomes exclusive. Certain things must be dropped. Their family that, you know, marriage is nothing to them. They say, oh, you know, my, ma my father was divorced once or twice or three times. So, you know, if it happens to me too, there's no, it's not a big deal, but I'm a child of God. God says, that thing better stop because you're carrying it with you and I don't like it. Their families that, you know, uh, whatever way that they, they, they see themselves in terms of who they are is shaped by what the culture had told them. They are household therapies. God calls for a change in those practices. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 11. Depart, depart, go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of our. Be clean, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. Depart, depart, go out from there. You should not send your money to any religious festival in your family if it's not the festival of God. He said, but I have to support it so that every family member will not say I'm rebellious. Isaiah 52, 11 says, depart, depart. Go out from there. Do not touch anything unclean. The husband did not know she took it with her, but it ended up killing her. Praise God. When God called Abraham, I found this interesting the first day that God really called my attention to it. Genesis chapter 12 verse 1. Look at how God called Abraham. This is the same family Abraham came from. He came from Syria. They were idols. Terah, his father, was idol, idol worshiper. Everybody was, Abraham was into all this stuff before. But look at when God called him. Now the Lord has said to Abraham, watch this. Read it together with me. Get out of your, let's read it together. What? Get out of your country, number one. From your family, number two. And from your father's house. To a land that I will show you. Why? Why didn't God just, just get out? God was calling for a total break. Get out of the culture of this country. I'm taking you to a different land. Number two, get out from the culture of your family that I don't like. One of them is household idols. Do you see? Number three, I'm from your father's house. What your family practices that I don't like, get out of it. What your own father practices that I don't like, get out of it. Your country, your family, your father. Why? Because God is an exclusive God. Some believers have gotten out of their country, that is the world, but they are still steeped into their family practices. You know, for Nigerians, Christians that still kill Ram and everything at Ilea, they say, ah, but I mean, half of my family, they are Muslim now, so what are we going to do? When God called Abraham, he said, everything in that family that I don't agree with, get out of it. Am I making sense to anybody? Even from your father's house. Rachel could not get out from her father's household idol. And she didn't make it to the land of Canaan. Ultimately where she needed to be. It, we have to be very careful. We have to be very careful. The second and the final thing I want us to see here is God also called for a change of behavior. One, a change of belief systems. 
Also, he changed your behavior. Chapter 35. After all the wanderings, they went from one place to the other. They buried Rachel. They buried Deborah and all of that. Uh, they dwelt in two other places. But now look at the development. They are still on the way. It took uh, This is years of moving because they settled here and there. Then God said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel. This is the third time we will hear this. God said, Jacob, even when you left Syria, you watch this, when he left, he dwelled in Sukkot. Then he dwelled somewhere to shake him. And I reveal something about this man. God was just looking at him. Where did I tell you to go? I told you, go to Bethel. May God give us listening ears. Praise the Lord. So, and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household, to all who are with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you. It looks like after some years, he discovered the foreign gods. The Bible says the last time he didn't know. But now, he now discovered that, ah, when we left, some people took some things with him, them. Now, God now said, go to the house of God. In order to go to the house of God, he now told everybody, put away all the foreign gods that are among you, number one. Purify yourselves. I'm in chapter 35, mm -hmm, verse 2. Purify yourselves and change your garments. What are those three things? Number one. Put away the foreign gods that are among you. Anything that is outside of the culture of the Bible, no matter how cultural it is to you, is foreign to God. Did you hear what I said? Anything that doesn't agree with the culture of Christianity, no matter how intimate that practice and that culture is to you, no matter how much of your family heritage it is, it is foreign to God. And now, this is the last place before they got to the house of God. And Jacob says, I know we have been traveling all these years with all these things among us, and I have not spoken, but now we're about to go to the house of God. You cannot carry the foreign God with you. They will get to a stage in your Christian journey that God says, I've been bearing with you some practices you do and all these things, but put them away and be sanctified. There are marital practices that people do that God says, that stuff, I don't like it. I'll give you one that I shared here before, some time ago. God is a jealous God, though, and his ways are different. Change your belief systems, change your behaviors. We live in a perverted world. And every good thing that God has made has been perverted by human beings. Every, everything. Everything. Intimacy between man and woman, between husband and wife, let me put it that way, is created by God for enjoyment, for procreation. But even that too has been perverted. And one of the perversion is all kinds of practices during intimacy between man and woman. We're supposed to say husband and wife, but intimacy happens everywhere now. And this is a little sensitive thing. And many believers didn't know anything is wrong. They practice it on their bed as husband and wife. Any form of practice during physical, physical intercourse that is different from the natural makeup of man and, women, and woman is a practice that God says, put that, that stuff away. Yeah, you, you grew up that way. That you used to do that before you were a Christian. Put it away. I don't want to see it. Because it changes my order. If you are going to go into a place of holiness. You say, well, what's wrong with it if we enjoy it? That's not the issue. You see here, there are three things here. Number one, put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify, cleanse yourself. But the third one is change your garment. When... I, I was studying for this and I realized that there are several passages in the Bible that God actually requires people to change their garment or to wash their garment. 
So what is the thing about garment? Your garment stands for your, your, uh, your behavior, what you are identified by. One instance is that when you take a, if you, if you go to Batu and you see a slave girl and you like, this is in the book of Deuteronomy, God was giving them law. If you see a slave girl and you like her and you want to marry her, when she comes to your house, she will dwell there for about a month. But she will change the dress she had on when you took her captive before you can lie with her. There, there is another person in the book of Exodus. God was telling uh, uh, Moses, tell these people, I want to do something. He said, but tell them to go and wash their garments. Physical garments. Why? It's a symbol for behavior. It's a symbol for where you are. And after this instruction, look at what happened. Verse 5. No, verse 4. We, we can even read verse 3, so we, don't, we, can, we won't miss anything. When he says that they should... Put away the foreign gods that are among them. Purify yourself and change your garment. Then let us arise and go to Bethel. And I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob, watch this. They gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hand. Thank God this time they listened. But see what I found interesting. And the earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the terrible tree, which was by Shechem, and they journeyed. And the terror of God was on them. All right. So let's, let's wait a minute. <laughs> he said, put away the foreign gods. Purify yourself. Wash yourself. Number three, change your garments. In response, verse four, they put away the foreign gods. And what, was, what does they do? They take off the earrings in their hand. And they gave it to Jacob. And what did Jacob do? He carried the gods, he carried the earrings, he buried them under the tree. And he said, now we can go to Bethel. What is that telling us? The earrings was part, was part of their dressing that identified them with their culture. And Jacob said, you cannot go to Bethel with this dressing. Wow. They have been, that's the way they've been dressing all their lives. That's the way they have been dressing even when they were with you. When we left about 10 years ago, that's the way we dressed. Jacob said, I understand. But now we are, going to go to, we are going to go to the house of God. His culture is different from your culture. What identifies you is different from his, what identifies him. And he says, give me everything. And they handed it over and he buried it. Now say, now let's go. There are certain practices that must be changed. Even after you have been following the Lord for years. There are certain behaviors that must be changed. Don't forget that Jacob and his father and his great-grandfather came from this culture. But now he's asking them to give, them all, give him all those things. Right? Because once we became the children of Yahweh, those cultures ended for us. So back to what I was saying. I just touched briefly. All these, listen to me very carefully, children of God. All these sexual positions, I'm sure you've had it before. All these sexual positions and things like that. That is different from the straight thing, how God created the anatomy of man. Where the man should be and woman should be, they are perverted. And many believers don't know that. And when God looks at you, God says, does that look like what I created? If it's not, you are walking perversion. I know that's a big one. You didn't even see that coming from this sermon. But I'm talking about practices. When we give our life to God, it says, change beliefs and change behaviors. If you are a Christian woman, if you are a Christian man, and your husband and wife, and you get in bed, and you do all this stuff that is being done that looks like, makes you look like animals, God says, if you're going to go to Bethel, cut off all that stuff. Because I didn't create you like animals. Purify yourself. Change your garments. Let us go to Bethel. Praise the Lord. God said to Abraham, leave your father, your country. Leave your family. Your father's house, your family and your father's house. And be separate unto me. There are many things that we are used to 
But when we become Christians, God says, that's not my culture. That's not my culture. And that is the word of God today. That certain things, you cannot take them with you on your journey. Even though that is the household practice. That's why Rachel died prematurely. We need to pray. We need to ask God, what are those practices and what are those belief systems in my life that were transferred from before I was a Christian? And I still run my family that way. I still look at my wife that way. I still look at my husband that way. I still look at money that way. You know, we still carry ourselves that way. We say, ah, this is how my father brought me up. This is how my mother brought me up. It doesn't matter what. I, you know, Last week, this week that passed, with this week that passed, there is uh, one of the children of God that I saw. And I said, mm, God help us. The appearance didn't look any different from anybody that has not been saved. And that person goes to church. That person goes to church. You know what God is saying here? He said, that dressing, that's the way you used to dress in your culture before you give your life to Christ. Now you give your life to Christ, you're still dressing that way. He said, that's, that's the transference. You have to remove that from you. Because heaven has its own culture too. People used to say this, well, faith is in the heart. If you believe only, God says, well, whatever is in your heart must be reflected in what is in your appearance. Whatever is in your heart must be reflected. So every child of God, please don't be deceived when you say, well, when I give my life to Christ, Christ lives in my heart. It doesn't matter what is on my outside. Why did Jacob say, take up, take up your garment, physical garment? Because that's how you are identified. If you still look like somebody going to club, even when you're out there, your dressing looks like you're going to club. You say, well, but I don't go to club, I go to church. Why does your dressing look like the one going to club and you are not going to club, but you're on your way to heaven? When you're about to go to better, they say, change that dress so it doesn't enter there. Praise the Lord. We need God's help, amen. Let's rise up on our feet. Jesus said you cannot put new... Wine. Where? In the old aha, wine skin. I want you to pray and just tell the Lord, Lord, show me every old beliefs and practices and behaviors that are still hanging with me that I need to change. Your family is not your God. Show me every family.